You're listening to the Venue Rx podcast, where we provide your weekly prescription of tips, tools, tactics, and inspiration to start or grow your wedding and events business. Follow along with our listeners as we delve into the exciting world of events. And make sure you check out our YouTube channel and social pages, where you can engage with our show host and guests. No matter if you're brand new to the business of weddings or an event pro, our mix of mindset and mechanics will challenge and inspire you. And now, without further ado, our host, Jonathan Amen. What's going on, everyone? Jonathan here with the Venue RX podcast, and I am so excited to be sitting here with my co-host, David. He is co-hosting a couple of these episodes with me, and I'm really excited, but we're mostly excited, both of us, to be sitting down with Chef Joanne. Thanks for joining us. Hi, thank you. Well, um, we have a great show, and I'm excited personally because I don't know your story. Hmm. So I would love to uh, kind of know about you a little bit. There's been this air of mystery that's uh, that's <laughs> been a kind of accumulating ever since David said, hey, we have to have Chef Joanne on. She's doing incredible things. And so, um, yeah, tell me a little bit about yourself, kind of. If you want to even go back to like how you got into the culinary world, that'd be that'd be really cool. Sure. Um, <clears throat> wow, air of mystery. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, well, I've been doing event catering and private chefing and various food related things for the last thirteen years. Um, started out really tiny, just me and private chef gigs mostly. Um, that's how all my initial catering jobs came to be. But while I was in school, um, culinary school in San Francisco, I was working part time for Paula LeDuc Fine Catering, which is like, she's the goddess yeah. of catering. Um, and I was at an event that she actually attended. She, you know, she was the owner of the business, but not working in it anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, and she was actually just an, an attendance as a guest and at like some epic fucking, can I swear on this podcast? Totally. You sure Great. fucking can. We clicked the, we clicked the <laughs> button not made for kids. So uh, let, it, let it roll. <laughs> so we're at this epic fucking mansion in, uh, in Hillsborough and then on the peninsula in the Bay Area. And she came to the food station that I was working and I was like, oh, it's so nice to meet you. Like can you tell me like your story really fast? I know you're here having fun, but, um, and she just explained to me how like she had no space in this tiny like studio apartment in New York city and would like put shrimp outside to cool on her like fire escape because she didn't have refrigeration like, or a blast chiller for that matter. So she's like putting food to cool outside because it's cold. Um, anyway, it was a really cool experience and she, she was like, you know, I, that's where I started and this is where I am now. And I was like, and that's going to be me. And that was the moment that I decided that I, that's what I wanted to do. I knew I didn't want to work in a restaurant. <clears throat> I had worked in restaurants as a, as a teenager. Um, and is that kind of where your whole experience with food started? Yeah, definitely. My, my father owned, um, a couple of casual cafes here in San Diego. Um, when I was a teenager, one in La Jolla called Panini Cafe and one in Pacific Beach called, uh, Cafe Crema. Okay. It's on the corner of Cass and Garnett. And it's now like a, uh, I think it's Dave's Hot Chicken now. Dave's Hot Chicken? Mm-hmm. Yep. I love hot chicken. <laughs> <laughs> My hot chicken. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, that was kind of my introduction introduction into food was when I was a teenager, but I always loved to cook and figure things out for myself. And I was a vegetarian for a few years in high school. My parents were like not about that. So mm -hmm. I was preparing my own meals a lot of the time and I, I was a carbitarian, but you know, it was good. Um, I actually had an epiphany though, like a couple of years ago that I don't think I wanted to get into catering because of my love of cooking. I think I, I realized that I, I really just loved to be a host and to throw a party. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, cause I had like this flash, I was like meditating or something, you know, having a Zen moment. And it just came to me when I was a little girl and I would be like getting ready for Thanksgiving dinner with my family, which was just us. It was yeah. just my parents and my stepbrothers and sisters. 
we wouldn't have other people over for Thanksgiving. That was the big parties were at Christmas. Anyway, I would like curl my hair and wear like a cute outfit and like help my stepmom set the table. And I, I wanted to be involved. Her and I had a tumultuous relationship. So it was kind of like a butting heads moment. But I really remember like wanting to be more involved. And the older I got, the more involved I wanted to become. And the more I just kind of started doing my own thing with that. Um, so, yeah, I had that epiphany. I think I just really I, I really enjoy being a host and creating like a whole experience for people. I love that. And I think there's actually a lot of that that runs through business owners in this industry. I, I and I oh, just yeah. can speak mm. to my yeah. own self, but I think it's probably very similar yeah, to you same, as well. Same. Like I've I always loved hosting. I loved food and was interested by it. And of course I started my business more in like a, for an environmental standpoint, but I loved hosting. Mm -hmm. That was when I would cook is for friends and I loved like mm -hmm. yeah, creating that vibe. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, yeah, I think you're right. A lot of people in the events industry, whatever the format is, is like, yeah, you want to create an awesome space or <clears throat> awesome experience, you know? Both of mm -hmm. you have such noble uh, beginnings. I realized oh, right yeah. after college that I um, just really liked getting fucked up at parties, <laughs> <laughs> sure, <laughs> you know, great. house parties, like, oh, and, yeah. but I was like, what I, I don't necessarily like being the, the star. I don't want to be like the most popular person there, but I loved gathering people together. And mm -hmm. you know, you're living in this house with all these guys. You have to make sure that enough girls come and you got to make sure <laughs> those eyes come the, on. The ratio was <laughs> good. <laughs> Beautiful blue gray eyes. No, no, come no, on. no. And then, you know, like, are we going to charge at the door and like how much beer do we need? And mm -hmm. all that really interested me. So then huh. once I got married and had my son, I was like, well, I'm trying to graduate from college. Not what streaking in do? the quad anymore. No, not streaking in the quad anymore. <laughs> but anyway, enough about that. That's not for a different, that's, a, that's for a different episode. Perfect. <laughs> um, so tell us now, what do you, what do you do now? Where, um, so how did that kind of translate to your meeting with that famous chef kind of along your line and then switching to doing your own thing? Was it, was it kind of immediate or did that just plant the seed? It was pretty immediate. I think probably within like a month or two, I went to the city of San Francisco, like city hall thing and did the business wow. tax registration and wow. filed yeah, a fictitious business name. And I mean, not that I had like any clients really at that time, not, in, not really in the city. Um, and then I moved down here right when I finished culinary school, after I finished my externship, I was working at Whole Foods Market because that was a paid externship. So right. I was like, definitely want to get paid. And it was great because I was getting paid San Francisco money, the mm -hmm. city of San Francisco money, which I don't know if you guys know, but it's pretty significantly higher yeah. than it is in San Diego as far as minimum wage and the base pay. So when I transferred to San Diego, Whole Foods and Hillcrest, they still had to honor my same oh, cool. wage. Oh, cool. She got the awesome. city pay. Yeah. So it go. was great. Also, some people found out what I was giving. Yeah, <laughs> they definitely had some like hard sharpening feelings. their knives. Uh, yeah, like, <laughs> Joanne. Yeah, I definitely I was very popular with certain employees because I was really good at what I did, but I was very unpopular with some other employees. And it was a very short lived thing. Once I was down here, it was a means to an end, really. Like yeah. the discount was dope, twenty percent mm -hmm. off. And I was private chefing for a family in Rancho Santa Fe. And so like working for them three days a week and then like slowly whittling down, like I had a pretty tight relationship with my supervisor. So it was like one day every two weeks. Wow. Yeah. Working nice. at wow. Whole Foods. Yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> so it was pretty immediate. And then within, I'd say like six months of being in San Diego was when I was started private chefing. And that's how I got the my own personal catering sea legs so to speak it was like you know they'd have friends over or they'd have a party her mom the my main client her mom and her husband lived in the same community in Rancho Santa Fe and they would have really big parties and I would help her private chef orchestrate these pretty grand events so that was really helpful to me um it had a kind of a rough ending being a private chef, especially for one family, pretty full time gets yeah. pretty personal. Intimate. Yeah. yeah I can imagine. And it, it just, it didn't, it, it was a three year run and, you know, and then we moved on from each other and it, no hard feelings, at least not on my end. I hope not on theirs either, but, um, it was a great learning experience. And, and I, after that really just promised myself I would focus on catering. And now, I have 
what kind of spawned from the private chefing was after a, about a year of not private chefing, I had another client beg me to be their private chef. Mm -hmm. And that was the birth of my meal prep company. So I own a meal prep company as well called Prepared with Purpose. Prepare with Purpose. I love that. That's cool. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and we... I, I want to interrupt you really yeah. quick because mm -hmm. I want to go back. You were talking about private chefing. Now you're going to get into the kind of this other side as well. But I wanted to know what are your both favorite parts of that mm -hmm. and least favorite parts because we have several private chefs who I'm hoping are going to listen to this episode mm -hmm. and um and they do a great job as well but I've been dying to ask that question like what are the favorite parts of of that experience because it is very personal like you said yeah you're in someone's home especially when you're on a consistent basis mm -hmm. you know you're preparing meals and they're giving you probably pretty immediate feedback and they're, oh, yeah. and they're probably sharing a lot about their lives and Definitely. their personal yeah. stories. And then it's yeah. like all in, all in 20. So imagine, mm -hmm. yeah. what, what was kind of a, was there, was there a highlight to that, that role that you had and then kind of maybe your least favorite thing? I would say the benefit of it for me was the routine and the constant ability to experiment because they always wanted to try new things. So it was an open forum for me to do recipe <coughs> development. You know yeah, what I mean? Like they, they knew and were very similar well, in age to me. So they were cool. Like they knew that maybe I hadn't made this dish before, but they knew that I was a good cook. Mm -hmm. So it was like, obviously it's not going to be bad. It's some of the credibility, be, some yeah. of the freedom. So that's neat. Yeah. That's really cool. So definitely like the creativity aspect was, was, was awesome. Definitely a highlight. And then also just the routine. Like I had a very steady set schedule and for the most part outside of trying to build my own business on the side from that, it was a situation for the most part, that I could clock out of, so to speak, you know, like I could leave work and be done and not get bombarded for the rest of the day by te with text messages or phone calls from my 10, 12 employees, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? So that was really nice. Um, the downside is the intertwine aspect, yeah, especially after three years with one family. And, you know, even though I did have a couple of other clients sprinkled in here and there, it was very intermittent. Yeah. The thing that I love about catering is that you get to, you get people at the be at their best time. Like you get people that are excited to have a party mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. they're really excited because they're going to hire you to make it not stressful for them. Yeah. So the interactions with a catering client versus a private chef client tend to be a lot more positive um, yeah. where over time and, you know, it's, it's inevitable that they're going to, have a, a, you know, a meal that they didn't love or, and as a, as a chef, the chef part of me takes, I try not to, but I take it personally. Yeah. Um, it's a labor of love and, you know, I have an amazing team now that I, I actually don't do hardly any of the cooking anymore, but when I do, it's still like, you know, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that, especially when you're feeding people that like are, really care about ingredients yeah. and the environment. And, and these people did, you know, these, most of my private chef clients were all really like their diet and nutrition and environmental impact was really important to them. Mm -hmm. And did, uh, um, well, I'm sure there's times also when they just had a bad day and they're oh, going to, they're sure. going to come yeah. in their, their palate's going to, anything's yep. <laughs> going to taste off that day. Cause they had a shitty day and they need to take it out on someone on you someone. Know? Or like, can you watch the kid for oh, an that, hour yeah. and like scope creep? Yeah. That kind yeah. of stuff. Like, <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, a big thing we're going to be world. gone longer than we thought. Can you change the laundry? Scope creep. Like stuff like that. It's like it's a, coming from your world. That's huge. Scope the whole, creep. the whole, yeah, that's, that's yeah. huge. Yeah, I think I think in any service business, especially when it's a regular business, but in general, you know, I think that's uh, that can happen where if you don't know scope creep, uh, this is when I someone don't. just basically, you know, tries to get more than what you're agreed to do. And that's why I think having that agreement being clear. But when you're day to day with someone. But it's tough, too, because I think with it, with scope creep, it happens more naturally when 
you are the type of person that likes to over deliver. Mm -hmm. yeah. And especially if you're customer service and you're just like there, you're looking yeah. to uh, constantly kind of exceed their expectations. And then they're like, I love this person. They're great. They're, yeah. you know, always going above and beyond. Oh, could you help me with this other thing? And you're like, oh, I, yeah. like I, I want to, but almost kind of the, the thought behind it is yeah. like, this is going to train them the wrong way for lack of a better yeah. way mm -hmm. to say it. 100%. I like, I, I think there's a balance. I, I, I love the power of the word no mm -hmm. and, and no sugarcoating it either. Of course, like, you know, we all go above and beyond for our clients, but sometimes no is just no. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of power in that when you're just like, no, and there's no reason to say sorry. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we always say sorry when we say the word no. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not necessary. Sorry but, is a sacred word, you know, like. But it puts you on the hook around. to do a good job when you're saying yes. Totally. Too, exactly. Is, or not, and, really and not cool. agreeing to something if you don't want to do it, mm -hmm. if your heart's not going to be in it, or if it is above and beyond or it's, you know, mm -hmm. because then people can take advantage. And I think you learn that as you go, yeah. you know. Um, but I think, yeah, no, naturally we're all, we all, we're in the service industry. We want to go above and beyond. You yeah. Know? Yep. Well, speaking of scope creep, this is the venue RX podcast. And David's told me that you are working on a very special project. Um, go back really quick before you tell us about what you're kind of working on and, and very currently here. Um, go back really quick. You were just starting to tell us about your, um, meal. Prep meal prep company, company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. a meals with purpose, correct? Prepared with purpose. Prepared with purpose. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I was really stuck on the purpose part. I love that. Um, <laughs> tell us a little bit about that. So kind of as a result of that other client asking me to be their private chef about a year after I had retired from private chefing, I just did air quotes. Um, <laughs> yeah, if you're listening to the podcast, go check out the YouTube because <laughs> you're going to see. And you're, and you're missing the best dressed guest ever. Yes. yes. Colors are incredible. Thanks. I thought yeah. I always had a fun shirt on. Yeah. The heck. Yeah. You've got a co host shirt on, okay? Yeah, okay. She's got go the guest much, shirt right? on. Yeah. And you've got the. I've just. You've got I'm the just, work shirt. I'm just work shirt. I'm it's working, bro. Polo. Yeah. <laughs> nice. That's funny. So as a result of that, I, you know, I was cooking for them and they had some friends that wanted to share the meals. So I would drop off half the food, same menu, half the food at their house on my way home. And then their brother-in-law wanted some and then their naturopath doctor wanted some. And next thing I knew, I had like five, six clients. Wow. And so I just transitioned them to like a weekly flat fee. I was cooking stuff from my house. Don't tell the health department that. <laughs> and then eventually it got really busy. And I, you know, with the catering and the catering and the meal prep company, both at around the same time, really started to blow up. And I that's when I got my own commercial kitchen space. And initially it was just like a shared kitchen rental situation. And then now I have my own. That's awesome. Congratulations mm -hmm. on just going through those stages because some people kind of go to one stage because they're so passionate about it, but they can't make it to the next level. And there's new skills that are required mm. when you take each one of those steps, management skills and oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. all sorts of things. Scaling what up. are some of the, maybe some of the biggest, actually we need to save this for later. Cause this is, I'm dying to know maybe what are some of the biggest adjustments mm. from just preparing meals to now you're managing people. Now you're mm. doing all these other things. So I'd love to hear that. Let's get to that in a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm so dying to hear about this, this venue that I hear uh -huh. maybe in the works. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, fingers crossed. Um, so currently, it's been a dream of mine for a number of years now, but I'm currently an escrow on a piece of property in Joshua Tree. Okay. Um, there's a little bit of a hiccup right now, so I'm not sure what's going to happen. But um, the idea is, and the you know the goal that will hopefully come to fruition here in the next few months is having a turnkey house that I can put on Airbnb. Um, I would also be out there for a significant amount of time as I do a build out on the rest of the space. Um, the current house that we're in escrow on is five acres of land. It's a um, really cute three bedroom, one bathroom house that was already established um, as a vacation rental. Has a really cool cowboy tub outside, like a really big one. Oh, cool. Um, That's cool. Not like a one yeah, person one. one. Yeah. It's like a four or five person Whoa. one. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, beautiful hot tub, like a brand new hot tub, really perfect, like L shaped plot of land that is all flat and has 
I don't think any yucca trees on it, which is a good thing. I don't know if you guys are familiar, but right now uh, yucca trees are, have the Joshua tree has been made an endangered species. So you can't take them down anymore. You have to move them, which I would do anyway, but it's very expensive to move them now. Hmm. So having a property in Joshua tree that doesn't have a lot of Joshua trees on it is a really big oh, benefit cool. yeah. um, just as far as construction is concerned and things like that. Um, so the idea is to have a kind of an eclectic mix of spaces on the property, different kinds of materials. Like one area would be kind of like a cool campground area, more of a, like we would have RV hookups where you could bring your own camper and then we would have some cool like remodeled buses or trailers and then some glamping tents on platforms sort of thing. And then we would have another area of, of the camp or the ranch um, that would be the more traditional like brick and mortar casitas. Mm -hmm. And then another area where there's like all just kind of like weird shit, like weird art installation spaces, like something Desert that's art. probably built with like a, you know, shipping container underneath, but then like adding kind of cool, like Salvation Mountain type shit to the exterior. So it's like got this really cool, like I fucking hate this word, but Instagrammable like <laughs> thing. So people can, you know, take their pictures and, you know, like a cool attraction, so to speak, but it would be a, like a livable space as well. That's cool. Um, and then, I mean, like my ideas are endless and my partner, Eric, uh, my boyfriend over there, he has also lots of really great ideas and, and yeah, we've just been nonstop like jib jabbing about all Fun. these things that we could do there. Um, but the, like the low hanging fruit immediate thing is going to be throwing RV hookups on there. And then hopefully by next fall, when we're on the other side of the COVID, um, you know, regulations, as far as the gathering sizes and all of that is concerned, because I'm not trying to piss off anyone in Joshua tree, especially not when I'm the new kid on the block. Yeah. Um, I think it's really important to try to respect the, there are a lot of people there there are a lot of venues there that haven't that have been completely closed down. They haven't been operating like not even on the down low. And there ha there are vacation rentals that have had gatherings um, on the much smaller end. still like within the regulations. But there are, is kind of mixed reviews chatter yeah, yeah. amongst the uh, the locals. Sort is of. it a small community? I don't there. Especially not. There is. Summertime, yeah. it's small. There's like the well, people that stick the the people that stick it through the summer is a very small community. But. Yeah. Well, the community of, of venue owners up there. Oh. I mean, is it kind oh, of a, a, yeah. no, it's a, I don't want to say a small town vibe, but does it kind of have like do you know who owns the other venues very, in the area? It's very tight knit. So I have one coordinator that I work with regularly out there, an event coordinator. So she has connected me through to these other venues that, and she's one of the only ones that's located in the desert. So mm. there are lots of people that come from Los Angeles or San Diego and they hire a wedding coordinator from that area and yeah. then they deal with the venues, you know, but this woman is dealing f with them directly all the time because she actually lives there. Mm -hmm. So she lives, she has a place here in Encinitas and a place Who in is that? the high desert. Danielle Murphy, uh, high desert love is the name of her business. Huh. She's like she has like very little presence on social media, but Love she that. is booked. That's cool. Because she's the only one really out there. Yeah. And so she's she's worked really hard to create these really great relationships with the um vendors and venues that are local there and also, you know, with people like us mm -hmm. in another city that have the same values that she has that she knows she can trust and bring in to the high desert to create like, you know, a high end experience for the clients. Um, so yeah, it is kind of a tight knit community of the vendors and venues out there because there aren't that many, there are a lot of vacation rentals that mm -hmm. can yeah. get, get away with it, but they're yeah. not like actually venues. venues. And, and so what is it like the, as far as 
zoning and permitting and everything to be like you said there's vacation rentals where people will like get an airbnb and then have an event you know or on ha- the lawn you, yeah, the, yeah yeah exactly and i've always wondered if that is actually legit and then to be like so I, i'd love to learn about that like how in your search for places are you able to know if it's kosher or not to be able to turn it into say a venue sure so it i was fortunate in my search that one of my friends, Adam Lambert, um, not the American Idol star, <laughs> uh, the owner of Be The Wellness, <laughs> I don't know anyone um, him and his famous. wife, Vanessa Lambert, are the owners of a company called Be The Wellness, B with two E's. And they host retreats all over the world that I've oh, been wow. working with them for years, um, doing all the ones in the United States. They have private chefs in other countries that they work with for those because it would be really hard for me to source ingredients in Africa or Costa Rica and things like that. Um, But all of the United States retreats that they do, I'm the chef for myself and my other staff. And so we're actually doing one in May, fingers crossed, um, called Bee Fest. That's going to be in Zion. So we've rented an entire hotel. Wow. That's so cool. It's going to be a 75 person retreat. That's And we do farm to table meals the entire, every meal, three meals a day for five days. Um, Anyway, so Adam and Vanessa were looking into doing a venue of their own as well. And Adam is a research nerd. He loves to research stuff. And so he was kind enough to like download all of his knowledge to me in this process. And Joshua Tree is much, much easier to deal with than Idlewild, which was the other place that I was Mm -hmm. hoping for. That place was cool. Yeah. Um, So San Bernardino County, especially when it comes to Joshua Tree area is very open minded about what it is you're doing. You just have to have like, you know, an honest conversation with them. And the permitting is significantly less money than it is in the world or Riverside County. Yeah. For like a CUP or for whatever you need yeah. to, do to get it permitted. So you don't even need a conditional use permit in, in oh, wow. San Bernardino County. It's called a Especially. Um, multi multi use permit, I think is what it's called. Minor use permit. Hmm. That's the one. There you go. Um, and basically you can have, you know, during this escrow process, escrow process, once the loan contingency is removed and all the contingencies are removed, I could really, I could take whatever plans I have to the county then and start the permitting hmm. process before I even close. Um, because That's you can cool. have a free, you know, meeting with them and just pay whatever fees for the permitting and all that stuff. And they, through the conversations that Adam had with them, they are just really open-minded about all of it. Did you feel like, um, I guess, what about Joshua Tree grabbed you? Because you had been out there before, Mm -hmm. you know, probably there was some aesthetic beauty there. You know, you maybe liked it, but why? Why did you choose? And I there, you said there in Idlewild was the other place you were looking. Mm-hmm. Um, did you feel like there was a need? Did you, you know, the other venues that are out there are, are booked, and you felt like there's a need here, or was it just like this is a passion project of mine? I want to go out there and do this. It's not necessarily going to be something that uh, need, I need to push full time, mm-hmm. but it's something that I'm just going to love. Which is, I mean, both are incredible. Honestly, right? it's a combination of both. Okay. Um, through my conversations with Danielle, the coordinator that I'm friends with, she thinks that there's a really big need for a venue that has indoor outdoor space because Mm -hmm. there's really not any indoor venue space at all. There's some small indoor (coughs) space at Happy and Harriet's and Joshua Tree Saloon, but there's not, yeah, but there's not like any large structures that, or like anything that can be, can protect from the elements on short notice, yeah. which is a problem yeah. out yeah. there. And um, renting big wedding tents are ugly and expensive. Ugly and expensive and not really weatherproof no. as far yeah. as the wind is concerned, which is True. like the big yeah, concern. Yeah, that's a big issue, yeah. Um, so that was kind cool. of like from, from a business standpoint and a monetary standpoint, I saw a need to be met there. And also just having, you know, being active in that community and having my catering business be there. And then the proximity to Rancho Mirage and Palm Springs too, is I'm a lot closer to those areas, which have a big need for good catering companies as well. So it's not just our venue that we're servicing. We're also servicing these other areas and the other venues that we already work with. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so from a business perspective, that was that. But from a personal perspective, I just it's a really fucking magical place. Mm -hmm. Like there's a special energy yeah. when you go there that it like it's 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 indescribable. Mm -hmm. You know, there's obviously some, you know, I can get real crunchy with it. Yeah. But there's some <laughs> vortex shit happening and there's just, you know. I, I'm a little crunchy. I'm a lot crunchy. Hey, so. crunchy is good. Crunchy's yeah. Crunchy so yeah, is it's good. just it's just it's it's an energy that is epic, mm -hmm. and I think that a lot of people share that, and I think that people that respect the desert feel that mm -hmm. when they go there, and I think that people that are assholes, it rejects them. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. there are certain places in the world that are truly magical in many ways and i think it's funny interesting when you hear someone say like oh like oh, oh yeah like yeah. oh you like, like tulum it. like yeah. oh the you mosquitoes. like sedona yeah. the mosquitoes like oh yeah. the whatever and it's just like you yeah. got rejected by that place because you yeah. don't belong there yeah you know what i mean same like, way we don't belong in beverly hills or mm -hmm. I don't know. exactly yeah i don't i, I yesterday we were driving back from i had a uh, catering a photo shoot in central california this week in Cambria, which was amazing. And um, on the way back yesterday, we were driving through LA and I was just like, I don't know how people live here. Yeah. 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 It's that same, same concept. That's yeah. really cool. Um, before we go any further, I, cause I do have a couple more questions kind of about the whole venue process. Um, I want to get to the segment of the show called the wedding wheel. And for those of you who haven't looked <laughs> at this or haven't seen our previous episodes with it's this a torture on it, device, it's, it is, it is, Where? it is. So it's, it's right here. It's a, a fun little wheel. So we spin it and I go ahead and spin it. We take a look at the question. There are a couple different questions on there. Um, we do have a, a safety question. The safety, safety question. Word? Oh, safety question. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that is, uh, what is your least favorite wedding song? So of all of the wedding songs that you've heard and all the different ones, I know I don't even are... need time to answer. Okay, I, I picked okay. this one. So in, David did pick it. So actually, maybe you should Somebody. just answer that. Anyway, what is There's your... so many at all. <laughs> the Macarena. <laughs> oh, really? I haven't heard that in a minute. Oh, oh wow. Fuck. Yeah. It's so bad. And oh. now just... it's going to be stuck in my head the rest of the night. Because I'm just happy, said... that one. Oh, yeah, that one's pretty rough. Uh, that Pharrell... one's pretty rough. The Pharrell, Pharrell. one. The f yeah. yeah, yeah. I actually dislike that primarily because my mom has it as her ringtone. I oh. kid you not. Cause I'm happy. And that like a ringtone version of any song is terrible, but like, oh, this okay. is like even, yeah. yeah. So mm. anyway, let's give this guy mm. a spin. Let's see what we come up with. It's a mystery to everyone watching. <sighs> what is the most underrated trait for entrepreneurs? What is the most underrated trait for business owners in your pers perspective? So underrated well, trait. And you have some time to think about it because we're gonna get back <laughs> to it here okay. in just right. a little bit. So if you wanna go, uh, okay. go underrated or overrated or whatever, yeah, whichever direction. But um, so let's talk really quick about this whole process of, of going. So you've you know found a space that you like. Um, once you start kind of like putting an offer in on it, was it, so it does have an existing structure on it, correct? Correct, yeah. So it's it's a residential property. So it's it. not a commercial property. Um, but like I said, there are lots of, there's a lot of room for, for growth and the, the county is very open-minded when it comes to development in that form there. Do you plan on living out there initially? Um, kind of not full-time, but yeah, I mean, yeah. full-time as you really start to develop it and yeah, as you definitely. build it out. Yeah, it'll be, um, you know, the, that's the low hanging fruit. Like I said, as an RV hookup and then getting myself some sort of van. David's going to be situation. there. I'll, yeah. I'll build out your RV. It's, yeah. It's cool. <laughs> um, so, so Eric and I and whoever else is out there helping us can stay at the property in the event that the main house is being rented at that moment in time. Like I said, it's five acres and it's L shaped. So the RV hookups, the initial ones will be clear on the opposite end of the property. The mm. structure is in one corner, which is kind of perfect because yeah. it just leaves all of the rest of the land wide open. That's cool. For anyone who's not familiar with Joshua Tree, how would you describe it? <laughs> it's high desert, high desert. Yeah, high it's desert like, weird. It's like the, it's like 
space trees <laughs> is the first word that comes to mind. <laughs> space Sounds trees, like a punk band. space trees, and trippy animals. Yeah, um, like the the topography like changes so much too. Just like f- from one mile to the next, like when you are going from you know. You're still technically in the high desert, but like from the basin, I guess, of the high desert, when you're on the main highway going up the hill to Pioneer Town or up the hill. So this property is is parallel to Pioneer Town. It's maybe about the same elevation, not quite as high, but it doesn't. But it's in a flatter area. So it's just Mm -hmm. it's so trippy and cool. There's like these areas that have all these crazy boulders. And then there's areas that are more just like kind of gravelly with all these all this weird shit coming out of the ground. You're like, how is this alive? Um, Eric discovered all these cool um, desert melons. They're called coyote melons and they grow wild out on the desert floor. And we discovered them at my friend's property that we were out at and there were some dried ones and they were like, it's like a little nature's maraca. Oh wow. Because they had the dried seeds inside and it was a really cool, it was a totally an instrument, um, desert (laughs) instrument. But yeah, it's just stuff like that. Just like weird. And it's, and it's, I think being in a situation where you're like, how did people live here and how did people make this work without modern technology is fascinating. And also all, all of it, it just feels really prehistoric too. Yeah. And there's, there's this, uh, what I think is interesting, you know, cause there is definitely, uh, an attraction towards Josh tree has been growing, but it's starting to really like rev up. And I think in the next five to 10 years, what, what's happening right now is the real estate market is booming, especially for the vacation rental side, mm-hmm. but the commerce around it has mm-hmm. not, there's, there's like a handful of places to eat at that are good. Maybe a handful. Mm-hmm. You've got, you know, Maybe. Crossroads Cafe, and that's the only place I really eat <laughs> at there. You know, there's a couple places, and that's what yeah. I found interesting is because it's tricky because it is a seasonal type business. Because the summers are brutal, they're super hot, you know, and and I think that keeps a lot of people away because it can be a struggle then. But I think you're gonna see. I think that's when the the real estate market is going to start going up when you see more of that accommodated, but it's not happened yet. Mm-hmm. And I'm waiting to see that. And it's still, you know, it still hasn't happened yet, which I find interesting, you know, and I think uh, it'll slowly start building more and more because for L.A. and San Diego, it's like the getaway spot. It's like the P- Palm Springs, but Joshua Tree more for the crunchy and the people want to mm-hmm. be out like kind of outlaw in the middle of nowhere kind of do something a little different than going to you know yeah the, sure. the arrive or whatever is there yeah and, no you way, know, kind yeah. of more of a resort yeah they want to go to like you know the integratron and you know mm-hmm. like have a weird experience you know but it's just interesting to me like i said is that i think we're going to start seeing more restaurants and sh- there, there's cool shopping for as far as yeah like, there's definitely not a shortage of rad like antique yeah, and weird curiosities yep. types of stores but food wise it's lacking it's lacking big time and uh so yeah yeah i think that's the gonna commercial be interesting kitchen. Getting yeah. a commercial kitchen there to service the area is definitely that's going to yeah. be a huge yeah. thing. Incredible. That Wild Willie Saloon is for sale. I know. Every time I pass by it, I'm like, how much is that thing worth? I there's know. this wild, there's this crate on the way through Moringa or no, not through Moringa, through, um, anyways, on your way to Joshua Tree, there's this old saloon, Wild Will, Willie's Saloon, right? Mm-hmm. And it's just kind of like off the main drag. And I always wonder, for a while, I wondered, like, is that place open? Yeah. And I, then I, now I it's like been for sale. There. I'm like, oh, God. Dude. It's if you massive. like, <laughs> yeah, it'd be a passion project, mm-hmm. you know? It'd be cool to like have it, but it wouldn't be a moneymaker, but it would be cool, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I want to ask another question, which is we, Dave and I were speaking on the podcast that we did together. And um, he was talking about how this, kind of is like the new American dream. Mm. Um, And I I really, that kind of like stuck in my head. And then he he mentioned that, you know, you guys were kind of talking about that as well. And I think that's happening a lot. I think in conversations that people are having in their living rooms, because people have plenty of time in their living rooms Mm -hmm. now, Mm -hmm. you know, they're talking about, let's like get out of this space. And so often I think in San Diego and LA and some of these cities that have a lot of people per square foot, you know, there's a, now that everyone's on lockdown or different things, you only have the space that 
you're in and mm. you don't feel as free to just go out. And so there is this conversation behind going out and getting a couple acres or, you know, and, the, and it's crazy. The place that I live now, it's this teeny tiny little postage stamp yard. It's really, there's no yard, um, big home, very, very small yard. I have four kids. I want them to go out and play. And I mean, I grew up on a ranch in Texas, so I kind of want them to have some of that. So our priorities definitely changed as we've been looking at different places. Mm -hmm. And I think that's happening a lot. So that's interesting that you're kind of doing, you're in the process of this right now. Are you, um, as you do this, are you finding other like-minded people that have kind of done the same thing for the same reason? Or has it, has you have not really have, have you not really had that experience so I, far? Yeah, I definitely have had that experience. Um, I mean, just this week when we were in Cambria doing that photo shoot, one of the vendors, <clears throat> the officiant, actually, we did an elopement and then a photo shoot for this venue that we're all working together to create micro wedding packages for. But anyway, um, the officiant shared that she had this dream of having a property with like 35 acres wow. with an animal sanctuary and a this and a that and like having an area to have weddings and, a you know, a venue and a retreat compound sort of vibe. Um, and then just through everyday conversation with the COVID times, it's like every, there is a mass exodus mm -hmm. out of the cities right now. Um, cause not only because of, I think people's desire to have more space, but it's like the recognition of maybe what's more important in their life yeah. and also, the ability to work remotely, you know, so many of these like corporate jobs that people were going to office buildings to do, a lot of those businesses realized they're still getting a lot of productivity from their employees working remotely during quarantine. So like why, you know, why waste tens of thousands of dollars a month on this giant commercial building anymore? Yep. Um, so I think that you know, it's from several different angles, but I think that, yeah, it's definitely a conversation that I've heard um, more frequently in the today times. But I have over the years, I and I think, you know, you kind of attract mm -hmm. the synchronicity kind of happens there because, you know, th this is something that I've been interested in for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And it, for me, it kind of started when I was traveling more and the probably the first time I ever went to Europe hmm. where I was like stayed in like an actual bed and breakfast for the very first time. And I was like, well, I could do. And then I was yeah. like, well, why would I just want to do like a tiny version? Like I want to do like a big version and then catering retreats too. That was the other thing. I think like probably the first yoga retreat I catered, catered. I was like, wow. Okay. This just like, like really inspired you. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, moving on. I want to know your biggest, kind of maybe learning experience that you've had. Um, you know, we say biggest mistake, but it really, it's more of an opportunity that maybe, you know, hindsight's 2020, they mm. say, is there a point in your business for any of maybe the young chefs that are, would be listening to this or any of the people in the industry who are kind of along their journey? Do you have anything that you feel like you could share that was a learning experience for you? Yeah. And I don't know that, if, that, that this is a true answer, as far as like, I don't know if this would actually work because I didn't do this, but I wish I had created more systems or had maybe reached out to someone that had kind of it more mm. in their wheelhouse <laughs> of like systems of operations going into things because it's kind of hard to, to turn that bus around when mm. it's going so fast in this one direction. And yeah. my wow. director of operations that I've only had for a year. I mean, I was my director of operations for the previous 12 years. Um, he was telling me the other day, he was like, you defy the way all businesses should be run, but like <laughs> you, but it works. He's like everything, everything. He, th he thinks I'm like the luckiest person on the planet, which I don't think it has anything to do with luck. I think I just have really good karma. <laughs> maybe. Uh -huh. Um, and I'm not a terrible business person. I just think that if, I wish that I had been able to create better organized operating systems and it's not necessarily too late, but it's just really complex. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We go through it too. Yeah. I know. <clears throat> I know that feeling. 
Yeah. Is, there's no like book on like, you no, know. No, well, or, and it's like, and the amount of time that it takes to yeah, do that when yeah. you already are managing like so yeah. many things, yep. you know, and it's like, and then the constant like, well, do I have enough money to hire someone else to take over yeah. this element? So yep. then I can focus on this, but yeah. then, yeah. So I would say that like, if I could, if I could go back in time and, as the business was growing, focus more time and energy on creating a more organized operating system. That's a good one. That's cool. That's yeah. huge. That's yeah. That's, and that's really impactful. I know it would have helped me yeah. a lot. It's I think still, most it's business still owners that bootstrap their business, you know, would probably, it's hindsight's twenty twenty, but it is because then it's like, I think it's like, you're just trying to get, you're just trying to do it, you mm -hmm. know? And then you're like, okay, now I want to scale it. Mm -hmm. Okay, scaling yeah. is fucking painful at the, at when you're doing it as like a lifestyle business. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then when you want to scale it, you like what, get a, uh, sometimes like a last minute big thing comes in. I'm like, I want to be able to say yes to this. Yep. Yeah. And, you're and like, you break all your I systems. Can't. And then <laughs> you people know, get, like, you know, it's like, yeah. And I think that's like I said, anyone who has, you know, uh, or their first one mm -hmm. or where they've grown it very organically, you know. Uh, a, a business operates very differently at one scale than it does double that or what. So yeah, absolutely. You know? yeah. And I think that's probably going to be our daily prescription for today. Yes. Uh, if mm -hmm. you are starting a business or if you are passionate about something and want to get into business, reach out to someone, kind of have the humility maybe, because yeah. mm -hmm. it definitely takes a layer of humility to reach out to someone and say, hey, look, <laughs> yeah. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm really passionate about this, but yeah, give me some insight. So I wish or, I would have. Yeah, you know. absolutely. So yeah, totally. Oh, cool. That's that's huge. Let's go back to our wedding wheel. I'm so curious about the answer to the question. So oh, we yeah. had what is the most underrated trait for an entrepreneur? Um, and I think this segues nicely just from from what we were just talking about. I don't. This is tough. I think. I don't know. I think. My, I keep wanting to say resourcefulness, but I don't know that that's an underrated trait for an entrepreneur. No, I think that's I think maybe people just don't realize how big of a part that plays. Yeah. If you're not an entrepreneur. Yeah. You know? That's fair. Nope, that's it. No, nope, that's totally it. Yeah. yeah. Resourcefulness is huge. Like having to just think on your feet so many times. Yeah. It sounds like you've maybe had to do that too <laughs> at various yeah. times. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All the times. time. That's yeah. like the number one job. Just the, the job description is problem solve. Figure it out. For sure. Like. <laughs> And we have five minutes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like I, we were doing uh, lunches for one of the hospitals during quarantine, and it was like a hundred. And I don't know what happened. I I'm very good at fi like knowing the weight. I have systems in place to like have the ordering be correct, but I didn't personally weigh all the vegetables for the side dish. And as we were going through the plating process, oh, yeah. we started to get towards the end of each little lunchbox. And I saw 20 more on the table and I'm like, there's only enough vegetables here for two more. Oh, no. So and I was like, what like what? Do, like, no, there's no more. Of it. I buy what we need. I try not to have any waste. So I was like, what can we do? And I was like, oh, oh my gosh, we have giant number 10 cans of black beans. So I was like, dump all of these boxes back <laughs> into the, yeah, the yeah. huge tub. Yeah. Heat up the black beans really quick, dump all the black beans in there, mix it up, yeah. throw some spices, and then yeah. put it back in the boxes. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, we were only, I think it was only 10 minutes late to doing the delivery. Wow. But we, yeah, we, yeah, it we've was had that. I've, I've like, had a similar Ooh. one at like 5 a.m., 4.30 maybe, um, doing a production of film shoot, and film shoots are always ready to serve early. And we're in our food truck and I'm with, it was a smaller job. This is a long time ago where I was still really heavily involved in the day to day stuff like this. And I'm with our chef and we're, we're, we're heading to the production. And this, this producer was like, if you're late, you're fired. Like, and <laughs> the pressure was on. So we're, we're getting ready. And I realized the truck is out of propane. Oh. It's 5. AM. You can't get propane. You can't fill up propane at 5. AM. And I'm like, fuck. <laughs> And we've got eggs, veggies to cook, all this shit, a menu that she's, you know. So I, um, I'm i like, and I'm like, we got a butane burner. How many do we have in the, we had them like in a drawer or something like, we got two. I'm like, okay, we're doing omelet bar. We're going to pitch it. They're going to be so um, stoked. And, we, yeah. and I'm like, we stopped at a, then we stopped at a, um, a grocery store that was open and got like, I don't like having to do this, but got like muffins and things mm -hmm. to put out. Yep. And I was like, I was like, 
Hey, I'm gonna leave her name out. What if uh, what? Uh, let's do a, let's do an omelet bar today. What do you think? If we let people order, we can give put all the ingredients. She's like, I love it. Great. <laughs> like, like never yes. let them see a sweat when the whole truck is dead. She's thinking we're cooking back there. We got two little butane burners oh. at the window, <laughs> yeah. making omelets. Everyone was so stoked. And then yeah. we finished breakfast and went and filled up propane. But oh, yeah. you know, you just gotta. Oh, yeah. Failure is not an option. That's when you yeah. say like mistakes or failures. I'm like. I don't know. I'm like failures, like real failures. I'm like, I can't think of any because you figured something out. Yeah. You know, uh-huh. complete failure. I don't think it's just not possible. Yeah. You know, cool. It's just not possible. Well, thank you so much for yeah, taking some time out You're of your, welcome. your day you and your schedule. Yeah. And I really appreciate you mosquitoes sharing are out. with us. Well, yeah. We're going to make it just in time <laughs> yeah. to beat the mosquitoes. But um, yeah, thank you so much. Do you, where can people get a hold of you? Um, where can people hire you? Um, you know, Great kind of uh, tell us where we can get in touch with you. So chefjoanne.com, uh, no E J O A N N is my catering website. And then preparedwithpurpose.com is the meal prep company. I love that name. Which so. is all organic packaged in glass containers. Okay. Um, so that's really nice reusable glass containers that you swap out every week. Um, so that's preparedwithpurpose.com. And then, um, on Instagram at Chef Joanne, prepared underscore with underscore purpose Instagram. And uh, on the Facebook, which I never check, same things. And is there uh, a radius that you deliver in for the prepare with purpose? All of San Diego County, Fallbrook okay. to Chula Vista or San Ysidro. Oh, well. Cool. Um, for prepared with purpose. And then as far as catering is concerned, I'll go anywhere. Cool. You're in Spain. I'll see you soon. <laughs> Have love. We'll travel. Cool. You can go to Essential Travel. Yep. You can yeah, travel, exactly. you can travel to Europe. Gotta eat. For, for, yep, for gotta eat. Kids gotta eat. Love it. Okay. Well, thank you so much. It was yes, really a pleasure you. kind you, of Jeff. hearing your story. And thanks, David, yeah. for co-hosting. And cool. We'll see you all in the next episode. Right thanks, on. guys.